So let's start chapter four in Bio 101. So chapter four deals with the cell. Now the cell is the uh, fundamental and structural unit of life. I've given you that definition already before. So before we get into the parts of the cell, and that's essentially what we're gonna look at in this, in this chapter, the parts of the cell and what those parts do, let's go back and look at uh, the people who basically help us discover what cells are. Okay, so uh, looking at discovering cells, so the first person uh, was Robert Hooke. Now Robert Hooke uh, was an English guy and he was around in the uh, mid 1600s and he was the first to discover cells underneath the microscope. And this is very similar to the microscope he used. It was very, uh, a very uh, simplistic microscope by comparison to today, and it had just one lens on it, all right? And so what uh, Robert Hooke did is he looked at cork uh, underneath the microscope. And cork is uh, essentially, it's uh, tree bark, okay? And uh, what he was looking at here is with the bark of the tree is actually dead cells. Uh, so when he looked at cork here and he saw all these small little uh, rooms, what he thought looked like small rooms, he called them cells. And that's what a cell is, is a small room. All right. So he coined the term cell. Now he did look though at dead cells. So the first person to see live cells was a guy by the name of Antoine Van Leeuwenhoek. And this was in 1673. Now, uh, Van Leeuwenhoek looked at um, different things. So he looked at water from uh, ponds and then like from drainage from around his house. He even looked at teeth scrapings and saw little things that he called animalcules moving around. So, you know, single celled organisms today. So either protozoans or, uh, or bacteria. All right. Uh, so, now we're going to make a, a leap uh, a little bit further, so about 150 years uh, in the future here uh, from uh, Van Leeuwenhoek to Robert Brown. Now Robert Brown was a Scottish guy, and this is in the 1830s, and he uh, was the first to discover the nucleus. So when you look at these cells, you can see the nucleus in all of those. Okay, so we'll talk about what the nucleus is here in a little bit. Next was uh, Theodore Schwann. Uh, he was German, this is also in the 1830s. And he said all animals are made of cells. So he looked at a bunch of different kinds of animal tissues, found cells in all of them. Uh, a colleague of his named Matthias Schlieden, uh, also uh, German in the 1830s, uh, looked at various different types of plants. Uh, and he came to the conclusion that all plants are made of cells. Now, uh, if we put ourselves back in the 1830s, uh, under Linnaean, Linnaean classification, uh, by saying all animals were made of cells and all plants were made of cells, that was encompassing all life at that time. So uh, at that time point, fungi were considered plants because they didn't move, right? So uh, this led to the cell theory, which states that all life is made of cells or all organisms are made of cells, right? Next was Rudolf Virchow. Uh, Rudolf Virchow says all cells came, come from pre-existing cells. So this was taken off essentially from the biogenesis theory, which states that all life comes from pre-existing life. Now this was in contrast to this idea uh, around the time called spontaneous generation. Now spontaneous generation is that life can arise from non-living materials put into particular situations. So if you put meat on a counter, uh, just that combination uh, would produce maggots. If you put hay in a barn, uh, that combination would produce mice. Now, if you put hay in a barn, mice would show up, right? If you put meat on a counter and left it alone, maggots would show up, but that's because we know today that flies would land on there and lay eggs. So, uh, spontaneous generation was disproved by Louis Pasteur, who did simple little experiments like putting meat underneath a jar and then observing flies landing on the uncovered meat and laying eggs. So anyway, let's move on to cell organization. And so let's take a look at a cell's main features. So this is just an um, a, uh, animal cell here, right? Uh, so let's look at the cell's main features. So these are features that all cells possess. So all cells have a plasma membrane. Now this plasma membrane is also known as the cell membrane. This is the boundary of the cell. So that is found right here. That's where that cell membrane is located. 
Okay, so it surrounds all cells. Uh, it is composed of a phospholipid bilayer uh, embedded with proteins, which we'll talk about much more in the next chapter uh, of its structure. All right, and it's going to control the movement of substances into and out of cells. Next is DNA. Now, so you're seeing these little lines here. That's uh, the DNA. That is the, the genetic material, as we've already talked about. Now, this cell shows a nucleus, and not all cells have their DNA within a nucleus. Uh, next, all cells metabolize. Uh, next, all cells have uh, uh, cytoplasm. So you're seeing all these cell structures. The cytoplasm is this jelly-like fluid in between those structures and that suspends them. All right. And lastly, uh, another structure uh, uh, that all cells have are ribosomes. Now you're seeing these little dots here, a lot of little dots on that structure. Those are trying to show ribosomes. And ribosomes are structures that synthesize proteins. So those are the five um, features that all cells have. They all have a plasma membrane, they all have DNA, they all metabolize, they all have cytoplasm, and they all have ribosomes. All right, so let's take a look at cell size. All right, so uh, look at its cell size. Cells range, most cells, you can see this yellow area that's highlighted, but I'm gonna go a little further on either end of that. So most cells are gonna range from one micrometer to one millimeter in size, all right? So that's where we're gonna find most of our cells. So one micrometer, so it takes a thousand micrometers to equal one millimeter. So micrometers are very, very small, all right? So, what constrains cells on the low end of this? So why can't cells get any smaller in this? All right, and that's pretty easy. So cells need to be large enough to hold all the materials necessary for reproduction uh, and for metabolism. So if they lose stuff for metabolism, the cell will die. If they lose space for reproduction, well, they can't reproduce. So that ends that line. If we look on the high end, so why can't cells get any bigger? It's because it has to do with surface area to volume ratio. So uh, cells are going to get their nutrients in and they're going to remove waste through their plasma membranes. All right. So as the volume of a cell increases, what happens there is that the relative surface area of that cell actually decreases. So if we go to this next picture here, you can kind of see this here. So just following these numbers, total surface area here is six, total surface area is uh, 150, total volume here is one, total volume there is 125. So the surface to volume ratio here is six to one, where here it's 1.25 to one, really. Okay, so, uh, so when we increase the volume of a cell, its relative surface area, surface area decreases, all right? So that can be a big problem in trying to get nutrients into the cell and remove waste out of the cell. All right. Now there are ways around that. So instead of having a cube, you can make your cell very long like this one here. That's a neuron. Neurons are literally like, so the nerve cell that I'm touching here at the end of my finger, that literally goes all the way from there to my spinal cord here. So nerve cells can be a couple feet in length, but you know, we're talking about them being very, very thin. So we're talking more spherically or cube shape, uh, you know, one millimeter is about all the size that we can get there. All right, let's take a look at prokaryotic cells. Now prokaryotic cells are cells that lack a nucleus. So these include bacteria and archaea. These guys are all single celled organisms or unicellular, and most of them are gonna range in size from one to 10 micrometers. So let's take a look at the structures that are found within uh, a prokaryotic cell and what those structures do. So first is a nucleoid region. So this area right here is a nucleoid region. And this is the region of a prokaryotic cell that contains the DNA, all right? There's only one chromosome in here uh, and it's in a circular loop. Now I know this doesn't look like it's in a circular loop. It looks like a jungle uh, there, but if you uh, spread it out, it would be a big uh, loop. Next is a prokaryotic cell wall. So when we look at the side of the prokaryotic cell, we see one, two, three layers to it, okay? So those three layers there, that first layer is the plasma membrane. The second layer is the cell wall. So the prokaryotic cell wall is a fairly rigid wall 
that surrounds the plasma membrane of a prokaryotic cell. All right, so it provides cell shape and also protects the cell. All right, so most of our antibiotics actually prevent bacteria from making their cell wall, which they, makes them more susceptible to our defenses. All right, next is a capsule, which you can see outside of that. All right, so I do want to preface this. So all prokaryotic cells have a nucleoid region. They all have a cell wall. The rest of these structures that I'm going to mention, not all cells have these. All right. So next is uh, the, uh, the yellowish layer that you see here, and that is known as the capsule. So this is a sticky outer coat of a prokaryotic cell. And by being a sticky outer coat, it's going to help the cell attach to surfaces. Next are these little hair-like structures you see all over, and those are called fimbria. Now, uh, fimbria are short, numerous projections on the, cell, uh, the prokaryotic cell surface there, and they're also gonna help the cell attach the surfaces. Now, if you're wondering how that occurs, well, there are forces that act upon these tiny little guys that we don't really interact with, right? So if they're uh, wet at all, moist at all, those little extensions uh, are gonna add a little surface area so that the adhesive nature of water will help them stick to surfaces. And also those little extensions uh, could um, uh, be used with static electricity and help them attach the surfaces that way. All right, next is the prokaryotic flagella. So we're seeing these guys here. Those are the prokaryotic flagella. So, you know, they could have one to numerous amounts of flagella. So the range on this is pretty large. So what the flagella do is they help, uh, so these are long projections on a prokaryotic cell and they move the cell so they help move the cell through their liquid environment. All right, the last structure I don't have a picture of, but these are called thylakoids. And if you could see them, they would be these green disc structures. All right, so thylakoids are structures that absorb light energy. All right, so the group of bacteria that have those are cyanobacteria. So those are the photosynthetic bacteria. Now I do want to point out once again, uh, capsules, fimbria, um, flagella, thylakoids, uh, these are not found in all bacteria, okay, or all prokaryotic cells. Um, but, you know, so, and I also failed to mention though, is that prokaryotic cells, like eukaryotic cells, all cells have those five features, right? So it has DNA, it has a cytoplasm, it has ribosomes, uh, it metabolizes, and it has a plasma membrane.